This time around, we are discussing the Monkey See Monkey Duominate. Can't wait for the comments section to say, wow, this is just like COVID. If the movies taught us anything, it's that there is evil amongst any and all groups. If this virus were real, Neanderthals on Reddit would probably call it banana fever. It wiped out humanity in my Plague Inc. playthrough, so it's obviously super deadly. Subscribe to my channel because subscribers together strong. While he brought about the existence of ape Lincoln, Tim Burton's version doesn't count, how it feels going against a team of six Hanzos, <laughs> Tallahassee nuts up for zombies but shuts up for dollies, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, oh, 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 Dr. Zayas, I love you, Dr. Zayas. My twin brother James Franco is the reason humanity is probably going to be wiped out. What is worse, dying or losing every semblance of who you are as a person and the relentless pursuit of mankind to advance itself beyond the restrictions of nature and humanity will ultimately lead to its downfall and return to monkey movies themselves. This time around, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Planet of the Apes' simian flu outbreak. With the advance of medical sciences, many in the profession work tirelessly to solve the enigmatic answers to the many incurable diseases that have periodically plagued mankind. One of which being the degenerative brain disorder Alzheimer's disease, a horrible disease that causes the continuous decline of a person's thinking, behavioral, and social skills in order to function independently. It is a form of dementia that affects many elderly people over the age of 65. And as of right now, there is no method of curing or altering the disease's process in the brain, only ways of slowing down its symptoms. This became the goal and life work of William Rodman, a geneticist for the biotech firm Firm, Gen Sis, who would spend nearly six years working to perfect an experimental drug referred to as ALZ-112 in order to cure his father of this very ailment. The gene therapy, dubbed as a viral cure, would seek to progressively nullify the effects of Alzheimer's with Gen Sis making use of five chimpanzees. Since chimpanzees are 96% genetically similar to humans in order to test this drug and its effects on their mental abilities. Of those five chimps, two of them would either go insane or attempt to escape the facility to be fatally shot. A female chimpanzee named Bright Eyes, however, was showing extremely positive results, most namely heightened intelligence. Though while she was about to be put on display for a bunch of boardroom bastards, she became extremely protective of her son and went berserk in the facility leading to security to shoot her to death. Because of this outburst, funding had been cut for ALZ-112's development. Not wanting his work to be diminished, Will took Bright Eyes' son Caesar, who inherited his mother's genetically modified intelligence, home to nurture and raise for eight years, while also taking samples of the 112 retrovirus to his home to administer monthly to his father Charles. Over time, Charles' mental condition drastically improved from the effects of Alzheimer's, enough to play the piano with with eloquent precision. But due to 112's virus-borne nature, Charles's body was quick to develop antibodies to extinguish the virus, forcing his father to fall back into the brink of Alzheimer's degradation. Will, seeing the improved condition stripped away from his father, sought to make a more virulent and aggressive form of the virus. He would report his findings to Gensis, who would eagerly back him in making a new strain called the ALZ-113. 113 would hastily be manufactured and administered on further test chimps. During an exposure test to a bonobo named Koba, the ape broke from his restraints and inadvertently kicked the protective mask off a chimp handler and the gas containment system of 113, causing the chimp handler to breathe in an airborne form of the 113 virus. In that one accident, this one inconspicuous moment, the future of the very planet would be dictated. That is how easy anything like this can start. Koba would show similar results of the 1112 virus that increased his intellect, while Robert, the chimp handler, would frantically try to find William's home to seek medical assistance since he was coughing up blood, sneezing blood, he was not feeling well, sweating profusely, not knowing what was happening to his body. And while trying to get the assistance of this scientist, he would be stopped by William's neighbor, 
an international airlines pilot. During this confrontation, Robert accidentally sneezed virile blood directly on the pilot's face. Days later, the pilot, displaying a nosebleed, would shrug this minor symptom off as he walked the floors of the San Francisco airport, flew a plane from San Francisco to France, to Chad, and numerous cities across Asia, unknowingly spreading the ALZ-113 virus everywhere he went, causing further flights from there to unknowingly incubate and release the virus globally. And the very next day, after he had sneezed on the pilot, Robert would die of his symptoms. Seeing how humans are treating his fellow apes, Caesar would want nothing more than for them to gain their own freedom. So, Caesar would subsequently release gases of ALZ-113 across the Gensis labs and upon primates of the San Francisco Zoo and furthermore from there to create a sizable force of apes that could be made to storm the Golden Gate Bridge and local law enforcement to establish their superior strength, but more so their willingness for peace if it means they can gain their freedom in the nearby Weirwood National Park. In the coming 10 years, a great cataclysm would tip the scale of dominance of our planet. Within the first day after the Golden Gate Bridge Rebellion instigated by these apes, eight people would die from this up-and-coming disease that would later be called the simian flu. Now about this virus, it works extremely differently between apes and humans, due to Homo sapiens having typically much lower immune systems. As stated earlier, the virus will replicate and repair brain cells in apes, monkeys, chimpanzees, and any other primates, working only in a positive manner to heighten their intelligence and understanding of language, tools, and basically making them progressively more human. As for Homo sapiens like us, the virus will be similar in nature to the Ebola virus, causing a severe multi-system syndrome affecting multiple organs in the body all at once and severely impairing their functionality. But most notably is the amount of internal bleeding that will occur, signified with notable symptoms of a victim bleeding from their nose at first, until profusely bleeding from their eyes, ears, and mouth. In this time of intensive pain, and internal organs slowly shutting down, anyone experiencing the virus will be extremely contagious, with their bodily fluids and even their breath spreading the disease to any others nearby. Due to its highly contagious nature, and patient one traveling across the globe, infecting tons of people along the way, within the first few weeks of this outbreak, the simian flu would reach a global death toll of 250,000 people. Of course, global quarantine efforts would be made to attempt to slow the spread of the simian flu, but would barely make any kind of hindrance against this pandemic. Because, as human nature typically dictates, the general population seeing widespread disease and death, for those that were not displaying symptoms yet, would demand answers from their government, and soon, anarchy would descend on major cities across the globe. Rioting and looting, murder and chaos would take hold. Warring in the streets among insurrectionists and domestic terrorist groups would lead to a further death toll, with militarized efforts fighting back as government agencies and militaries were stretched thin, attempting to research ape specimens, trying to develop a vaccine as the simian flu extended its reach without restriction. With waning human population numbers, catastrophic events would occur, such as nuclear power plants hitting critical mass, civil wars breaking out in numerous countries, and chemical spills polluting water supplies. Within only seven years after patient zero, the simian flu will claim up to 6.5 billion lives throughout all nations on our world. Of those that somehow survived this virus, it is hypothesized that many people will have a natural genetic immunity to the virus and will have to survive the harsh environments of a lawless wasteland for elongated periods of time. While some may be immune, the simian flu will eventually mutate to ravage the remaining population, becoming even more viral than before and becoming dormant within all of man. While this new mutation will 
no longer be fatal, that's a plus, it will instead become the exact opposite of its original intended purpose, invading the broca area of the brain, impeding someone's ability to speak and communicate entirely, and reverting the individual into a primal state. Basically, get a little drum roll for this one. Return to monkey. See, I can put in memes too. The virus will also become more contagious, being able to stay on surfaces for long periods of time and also being able to infect those that were once immune to its effects. Any humans seeing these symptoms of others turning feral or simple-minded would see them as contagious carriers and ones that must be exterminated on the spot. So, no matter what, the disease will end up taking everything from you, whether it be your life, or who you are as a person. All while apes swore and argue amongst themselves on what to do about the fearful remaining humans to either coexist with them in their dying breath or put the final nail in their coffins. So that's the lore of the virus and what it can do. Usually lore doesn't take this long, but it's easy to see how its real world implications could realistically unfold. A virus that spreads through liquid or airborne contact that can kill you within days of showing initial symptoms, killing off anyone that doesn't have a predispositioned genome to resist the simian flu's deathly influence, killing 250,000 people in its first week is no joke at all. And even even with our highest precautions, a pilot unknowingly spreading it at key city points around the world would leave little for any country to call for a state of emergency and nationwide quarantining in time, especially considering how delayed of a response the world had to a recent pandemic and how governments were so reluctant to begin shutting things down. If you merely breathe near or touch something an infected person has coughed or sneezed on, you will be marked for death. If she breathes, she's a monkey. It's a disease that would rival and even quell the death count of the bubonic plague. But in our scenario today, what if a malevolent leader like the bonobo Koba actually took control with his intent to kill and keep the rest of humanity enslaved and in cages? Well, we have to look at how humans have treated the monkeys that are starting to rise up. Because of the simian flu's name and its origins amongst the apes of the Golden Gate Uprising from where everyone knew this started, many armed individuals would seek out any primates held in captivity in zoos and parks and outright slaughter them out of anger and fear to what they assumed started this disease. Apes would imitate the very violence that humans had been treating them with for so long, but tenfold. Humans seeing apes as a danger to their diminishing numbers and survival would also resort to gunning them down in any given chance. Because a majority of humans in their fearful state display a violent nature, and because of their horrible experimenting on the very apes that were around since the start of the outbreak, what they did to apes in the past, the apes could, and in most cases, rise up and revolt in equally violent ways. Apes after being exposed to either ALZ-112 or 113 will be quick to pick up basic sign language, tactical coordination, advanced empathy, and learn how to use most basic tools and weapons. In their first day of advanced intellect, they were able to band together to overwhelm the SFPD by using fashion spears thrown in unison, clinging to high ground to attack from above, overturning vehicles to protect themselves from enemy gunfire, all to gain freedom for themselves. They will gain enough intellect to rival humans in these kind of confrontations and be a really resilient force. And on top of that, as we all know, apes are just naturally stronger, more resilient, and more agile than any human. Direct confrontation with a chimp, great ape, orangutan, or any other variant of these simians that have become league smarter will be a threat, considering how most of them can easily rip a human arm off just by simply playing with them. When it comes to humans, there's not much variety in our species, except for some people that might be more muscular and more smarter. But with simians that are banded together, we have orangutans that are just more bulky. You have gray apes that are just going to be able to withstand gunfire. There is a lot of variety in their ranks that they can use to their advantage, with even smaller monkeys being able to sneak into places. Apes not led by C4 
Caesar could bide their time in forests and parks as human populations struggle to survive, waiting for pockets of people to hoard their resources and weapons, while the monkeys themselves create fortifications, strategize their best routes into human strongholds, and learn more in the ways of proper linguistics in order to better rally fellow apes and work more effectively especially since they will know sign language, allowing them to communicate without actually giving out any sound to execute more stealthy plans, and all while recruiting more apes as they progress across the country. Although it's possible the disease has spread to other apes around the world because of this infectious disease, leading to pockets of highly intelligent ape colonies that can eventually congregate and expand their influence. When invading human encampments, they can use a variety of tactics to usurp whatever weapons they wanted, from utilizing their visage as a simian to pretend to just be a stupid monkey, to lower the guard of armed people enough to snatch a gun or two and blow them all away. Or they could stealth their way into encampments from above, swinging around in trees or onto high-rise buildings to acquire these weapons, or using smaller monkeys to sneak in and do some reconnaissance, or use their great apes, orangutans, and other bulky simians to brute force their way in with their sheer numbers and bulk. Apes would withstand a lot more damage and be able to attack in much more creative and tactical ways that stretched thin human colonies would not be able to hold back against all too well. The apes could eventually overwhelm us and either see to dismembering us one by one with their superior strength, or locking us up in cages and exposing us to other survivors or items that are ripe with the simian flu, so they can watch us slowly devolve into subservient, lower intelligent life they could use for forced labor, experimentation, and entertainment, basically reversing the roles we imposed on them for generations. While at first armed forces could dispatch these apes easily, the simian flu would slowly wane human numbers down and cause them to quarrel amongst themselves on what to do with infected people in their ranks, some wanting to outright kill them to prevent further infection, and others disputing the inhumanity of killing fellow humans with extinction drawing so near, and the fact that the virus itself was no longer fatal. Why kill someone that is just getting stupider, but they're not gonna die? As seen in War for the Planet of the Apes, Colonel McCullough had been preparing weapon stockades not to prepare for war with simian factions, but to prepare against other human settlements that would eventually come to wipe them out. It's not too far from the truth that groups of humans would vie for dominance to uphold their beliefs in how to keep humanity strong and prevent non-existence from happening, only to kill each other and exacerbate their inevitable conclusion. Humans are just so great at killing each other that we're gonna do it ourselves. In the end, the virus will ravage a large percentage of the human population. As we watch ourselves, our friends, our family bleed out of every orifice of their head until they eventually die of internal bleeding and hemorrhaging. Considering this virus's roots in trying to be a cure, a gene therapy retrovirus to really counteract the effects of Alzheimer's, honestly, it would probably mimic the virility of the disease and be quite difficult to make a vaccine for and would be too much to try and create while the world is descending into anarchy and chaos. Everything would be stretched too thin for a vaccine to be made in time, knocking out about more than 95% of us, leaving a number of only around 14 million living humans and 6.9 billion people dead worldwide. Now that's a result anyone would love to see in Plague Inc, but hate to see in live action. If you are not immune to the virus during its fatal phase, you will have to rely on survivalistic instincts and trust whoever you end up in camps with while trying to avoid anything potentially infected with the mutated variant of the simian flu years in, just to get by. But with how infectious the virus is, it's inevitable that you will eventually succumb to this retrovirus and mentally degrade enough to where learning any kind of language will be seen as quite a feat. While becoming more animalistic isn't necessarily the end of your life, your life will be in the hands of either uninfected human beings who may execute you fearing further infected numbers 
or you're now primitive brain resorting to surviving without knowing how to use basic tools in a harsh environment so it might not be too much different of you trying to survive out the good old outdoors and considering a bunch of us have the survival instincts of a potato in the middle of a desert i don't think a few less iq points would be doing us too many favors or whatever dominant ape group is nearby and what they decide to do with you you could become their pet, they might let you try to survive on your own, or they could resort to torturous enslavement or even outright killing you so that these apes could see to the true end of the human race's brief history on this world. With humans gone, everything they have left behind will be utilized and restructured to fit what will be known as the, the planet, planet of the Apes.